need to know behind the rise of the godfather Don Vito Corleone. His ascension to power was not as smooth or straightforward as you once thought. Before Vito, there was a man far more powerful, a man who Vito himself would not dare to cross, a man he could no longer avoid. In The Godfather, we meet Vito at the height of his power. We only hear stories about his capabilities and genius, but we really never see Vito in action. Before he would ascend the throne as the most powerful mob boss in the country, Vito had to face the biggest challenge of his life, almost costing him everything. This was a period of time that changed the criminal underworld forever, shaping the world that would become known as La Cosa Nostra. This was the era known as the Olive Oil War. I went my own life. I don't apologize to take care of my family. And I refuse to be a fool dancing on the string held by all those big shots. What was happening at the time? It's 1933 and Prohibition had just ended. There were a few families scattered across the city. However, the real power was held by two major families, the most powerful being led by Don Giuseppe Mariposa and the close second, Rosario Lacanti. Although not the most powerful of the New York Dons, Vito was on his way up. Prohibition had made all the families rich, but the way each one of them spent this wealth was to determine where they would stand in this new era. Where most of the other Dons focused on building their army and really just enjoyed their wealth, Vito spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to secure the loyalty of powerful senators, judges, police officers, lawyers, journalists, bankers, you name it. He would soon have the entire city in his pocket. To the public at the time, he was still just known as a successful businessman. His own family were not aware of the true nature of his business. His reputation served him well, being known as a fair and honorable man. At the same time, no one really considered him much of a threat. But behind the scenes, Vito was slowly building a legion, a loyal, capable army that he would soon deploy. As we mentioned, Don Giuseppe Mariposa was by far the most powerful of the New York Dons. He had by far the most powerful family, primarily because of his extremely capable capo regimes, which included the likes of the Barzini and Rosado brothers. Having recently taken out the second most powerful family and his long-term rival, he now felt unstoppable and so wanted to consolidate his power once and for all. The Lead Up to the War after a few skirmishes here and there, it was evident that this needed to end, or the criminal underworld would descend into chaos. Mariposa and the Corleones did not see eye to eye. Therefore, Don Mariposa, to the surprise of most people, was the one to call for a meeting. But it was clear to Vito, peace was not the only thing on Don Mariposa's mind. Spring, 1933, on a Sunday afternoon at the Church St. Francis in Midtown, Don Mariposa had summoned the heads of the families from New York and New Jersey. Although tensions were high, Mariposa chose to hold this meeting in a church as a show of goodwill. Regardless, Don Vito tasked his capos to ensure they had their men scattered across the area, where if something was to happen, they would be ready. This was a very tense point of time in the criminal underworld. They would need a miracle in order to keep things the way they were. After a small commotion and subtle digs at each other, the meeting officially began. Don Mariposa sat at the head of the table. The atmosphere was extremely tense. However, as usual, all the Dons were cordial. It was a chess game. In meetings like these, when people of power sit together in the same room, there's a set of unspoken rules, a code of conduct that they all follow. But what's interesting is that the first to get emotional in any way usually means they have already lost, which is why they chose their words very carefully. And yes, even bitter enemies can't just openly say whatever they want, so they have to be subtle. Mariposa started the meeting with a clearly rehearsed speech about peace and the need to start working together as businessmen rather than animals. This was no surprise. Everyone seemed somewhat bored, waiting for Mariposa to finally get to the point. He would go on to describe what would soon be what we now know as the commission, but he was not done. He then went on to make a speech about how due to the repeal of prohibition, his family had lost a significant amount of their income, and his men were not too happy. They wanted war to then take over everything from New York to New Jersey to replace the penny they were making during Prohibition. Of course, this wasn't what most of his men wanted, rather, his own ambition. It was a threat, a threat that he could actually back. However, it was an introduction into his real demand. Price of not starting a destructive war that will in fact hurt everyone involved were only a few things. A small price to avoid any unnecessary hostilities. His first demand was, not too surprising, coming from an egotistical man like Mariposa. Since he was the most powerful, he demanded to be acknowledged as the boss of all bosses. One man, one boss. Hey, don't work no other way. 
Each Don could remain the boss of his own family. However, he would hold that title and must comply with his laws. They would all work for him now. The second demand was perhaps equally as disrespectful. Since he had a small beak, Mariposa demanded 15% of all their operations. Upon hearing this, the Dons looked to each other around the table, watching for each other's reaction. But not a single one of them gave away a thing. Although Vito noticed Anthony Stracci of Staten Island did look somewhat disturbed, and Ataleo Cuneo looked slightly uncomfortable. But on the other hand, Tatalia seemed to be delighted by this proposal, and began to make the case why it was their best option. Even Mike DeMeo of New Jersey stood up and made his opinion known, completely backing this proposition. But let's see how Vito responds. To Mariposa's surprise, he agreed. Vito stated that it was actually reasonable, a worthy price if it meant it will maintain peace. The other Dons, too, seemed somewhat surprised, looking at each other again to see a hint of a reaction, but to no avail. In the end, Vito stood up and thanked Mariposa again, shaking his hand. He then made his final remarks and apologized for not joining in in the following banquet Mariposa had set up, citing he had promised to help his son finish a report on the mayor who was going to clean up the city, which then triggered a round of laughter from the Dons, except Mariposa. And since he was a man of his word, he had to tend to his son. They all then shook hands and exchanged a few polite words with the rest of the bosses. Then Sonny opened the door, and then the Don walked out, followed by Jenko and Luca Brazzi. So, there's quite a lot to unpack here, so let's start by analyzing Vito's strategy. What was Vito thinking? Vito knew the other Dons didn't like what they heard, but went along with it since it was a better alternative than a prolonged war. But it gets a lot deeper. You see, both Vito and Jenko believed that Mariposa was after them. They were now the last family that had a chance to dethrone him, so this meeting meant nothing to him, no more than a smokescreen to a much more intricate plot. We'll get into what it was in a minute, but what is clear is that Vito's next few moves were crucial. He needed to be ready. For now, they were going to pay the 15% and act as if everything was fine. Vito knew Mariposa was greedy. The 15% was only the beginning. He also knew that the other Dons were smart enough to realize this too, but they were left with no choice. So until Mariposa came for them, they were going to prepare for the inevitable. Vito then ordered Jenko to get even more politicians and cops in their pocket, much to the dismay of his consigliere, who told Vito that this was getting way too expensive, especially that these big shots were constantly asking for more. But Vito then responded, in the long run, trust me, Jenko, that will be our greatest his strength. Mariposa tried to use Law 3 of the 48 Laws of Power, which states, use smoke screens to disguise your actions. Deception is always the best strategy, but the best deceptions require a screen of smoke to distract people's attention from your real purpose. The bland exterior, like the unreadable poker face, is often the perfect smoke screen, hiding your intentions behind the comfortable and familiar. If you lead the sucker down a familiar path, he won't catch on when you lead him into a trap. However, Vito knew this and would soon use it to his advantage. And what Mariposa does next, well, let's just say sparks something that no one saw coming. Mariposa's First Move in a small restaurant on the east side of New York, Peter Clemenza and Consigliere Jenko Abadondo just received their order. It was a small, intimate restaurant with only six tables, a place where they go to quite frequently. When seemingly out of nowhere, the restaurant's large, heavy door opened. Two men in trench coats and fedoras entered the restaurant. They greeted Pete, and they started to pull out their guns. But before they pulled them, they were both frozen at the absolutely terrifying sight of the beast Luca Brazzi, who had just come out of the kitchen. Although unarmed, he made everyone stop in their tracks. The sound of two gunshots outside broke the silence. It seems that someone had taken out their driver. It was time to get this over with, but before they could fully take out their weapons, four man at a nearby table had already drawn theirs, and, well, you know what happened next. Clemenza nonchalantly then took a sip from his wine glass and then gave orders for his men to begin cleaning up. But as they began to clean up, someone else emerged. Frankie Pentangeli also walked out from the kitchen and then joined Clemenza and Jenko. Now, I'm sure you're a bit confused as to what just happened. Let's take a step back and understand how we got here. Mariposa never wanted or expected Vito to accept the terms he set out. He needed a valid excuse to take out Vito. He would need to move quickly to ensure Vito would not see him coming or start scheming his way out of his trap. But since this attempt failed, he needed a new strategy, and he soon found it. His plan was quite simple. Take out Vito's top men to cripple him. He would then be forced to come back with his tail between his legs, in which Mariposa would then take him out himself. 
To do this, he did the following. Instead of sending his own men to get the job done, he brought in two outsiders, having had his spies track down the places Pete and Jenko would frequent to then take them out there. But what Mariposa didn't realize is that they were actually three steps ahead the whole time. You see, two of Mariposa's men had been secretly reporting to the Corleone family, specifically one of his capos, Frank Pentangeli, or as most of us like to call him, Frankie Five Angels. Frankie had warned the Corleones just in time that they were ready although his attack was foiled and went by smoothly for the Corleones. This was officially a declaration of war. They would now hit the mattresses, because this was only the beginning. The War Mariposa was determined to get rid of Vito by any means necessary, but at the same time he needed to be quick to make sure the other families don't start turning against him. He soon sent word to Al Capone of Chicago to send his two best gunmen to finish off Vito. However, thanks to Frankie, they were ready for them, and unfortunately for them, it was Luca Brazzi who was at the station to greet them. They then took them to an abandoned warehouse, and well, I'll let your imagination do the rest. Vito then sent back a chilling message to Capone, which read, You now know how I deal with enemies. Why does a Neapolitan interfere in a quarrel between two Sicilians? If you wish me to consider you as a friend, I owe you a service, which I will pay on demand. A man like yourself must know how much more profitable it is to have a friend who, instead of calling on you for help, takes care of his own affairs and stands ever ready to help you in some future time of trouble. If you do not wish my friendship, so be it. But then I must tell you that the climate in this city is damp, unhealthy for Neapolitans, and you are advised never to visit it. In The Art of War, Sun Tzu states, Let your plans be dark and impenetrable as the night, and when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. Vito followed this principle, and it worked perfectly. The Capone sent back word that they would not interfere again. This further humiliated Mariposa, and now Mariposa had Vito's undivided attention. Vito wanted a strategy that could end this war as quickly as possible. It was not going to be easy, but he no longer had a choice. He ordered hits on Mariposa's operations in gambling and unions, two of his most important important sources of income. But the reasoning behind this is what's interesting. The reason was not just so Mariposa loses some of his own income. He already possessed a large war chest, but rather to make him lose the loyalty of his key men, who were the ones who would be affected the most. But his strategy goes further. He also ordered his men not to go too hard on the Rosado or Barzini brothers, which is quite strange from the outside, yet brilliant at the same time. He was thinking ahead. He knew that Mariposa underestimated the true power of the Corleone family, in which in the past few years, years had grown exponentially, and we'll get into that in a minute, but his strategy in regards to the Barzinis and Rosados was essentially to divide and conquer. You see, the other families feared Mariposa, not just because of who he was, but rather who was under him. In fact, Vito and all his inner circle considered Mariposa stupid, and they treated him as such. He was never the biggest threat, it was his capos that everyone didn't underestimate. Vito didn't need to completely decimate Mariposa's entire organization, he just needed to take out the head of the snake. As mentioned in the 36 Stratagems, to defeat the bandits, capture their leader. If the enemy's army is strong but is allied to the commander only by money or threats, then take aim at the leader. The rest of the army will disperse or come over to your side. So, after the war, he would need to deal with them. Therefore, making unnecessary moves that could be detrimental in the future was unwise. Even though they were outmanned, they still fought. Mariposa definitely underestimated the Corleone family, which was another strategy Vito utilized. But what happened next would completely change the course of this war. My fellow citizens, we are at war. Following the attempt on Jenko and Clemenza, it was no longer safe for the family to reside so close to the action. So Vito had to speed his plans along and finally move his family into the newly built Corleone compound on Long Island. Barzini described this new compound as an impenetrable fortress with a large wall around the compound with various guard posts. Vito was now quite literally untouchable, so Mariposa would need to get creative. A few months earlier, Vito and his family had been personally invited by the councilman to join a parade alongside the mayor and all the other big shots that was to be taking place in the spring. Now, this was a couple of months ago, and now with everything that's transpired since, Vito needed to consider if it was a safe move to make. After some consideration and discussing it with his consigliere, given that the mayor, congressmen, judges, journalists, not to mention an army of cops attending the parade, Vito reasoned that Mariposa was not stupid enough to get slick at an event like that. The heat that would come would risk the very survival of all the families across the country. It would undoubtedly turn 
turn against him, so he saw no need to cancel his plans to attend, but he still took some precautions. He tasked Clemenza and Luca Brazzi to handle his and the family's security. His men would never be too far away. The parade began, and it was great. Vito was with his family, who were all enjoying the festivities. But what happened next? Well, changed everything. Out of nowhere, a man jumped over the barricade shouting Luca Brazzi's name and started shooting wildly. What ensued was utter chaos. Brazzi was hit but still managed to land a few hits. When more of this gang seemed to appear out of nowhere, the Corleone men then sprung into action. Sonny held Tom with one hand and the other held a gun, firing it at someone. Vito sprawled over his wife and kids, soon getting his hands on a gun himself, both taking out a few of the assailants. But within the chaos, Vito was shot and fell to the ground. Brazzi, who was shot himself, took Vito to safety. All of this happened within a matter of seconds. Soon, an army of cops descended onto the scene, arresting everyone they could, including Sonny and the injured Vito, who was thrown at the back of a police van with no concern over his injuries. This was a very costly move, and everyone was now going to have to pay the price. Mariposa had brought in an Irish gang who had a vendetta against Luca Brazzi, and now Vito Corleone, who had taken Brazzi under his wing. They were supposed to get the job done so that the other families have someone to blame. He knew that no one would be happy with handling matters in public, and so it came with a lot of risk. The bosses understood that to survive, they needed to remain underground, as far away as possible from the public eye. Now, an army of journalists surrounded Vito's home in Hell's Kitchen. This was an obvious play, attacking Vito when he seemed vulnerable. But no one thought Mariposa would take such a dangerous risk. The entire country was now talking about this mysterious organization called Cosa Nostra, talking about all the innocent victims that were caught in a crossfire. It affected not just Mariposa or Vito, but all of the New York families. This was the worst mistake Mariposa could have made. He took a risk, and it completely backfired. The end was near. Vito was weakened, but Mariposa was also now not looked upon too favorably. Whoever makes the next misstep would end up being their last, and it wouldn't take long for it to happen. Later on that same day, something almost no one saw coming happened yet again. It was a day truly full of surprises. Mariposa's top capo regime, Ilio Barzini himself, traveled to Long Island to meet with Don Vito and broker a deal. But wait, why would Barzini want to betray Mariposa, his Don? Well, to answer this, we have to bring you back up to speed on something that happened within the Mariposa organization. You might have noticed that we mentioned earlier how there were two traitors within Mariposa's organization. The first being Frankie Pantangeli, and the other was T, who was a Emilio Barzini's close friend, and someone he looked up to. Barzini took him under his wing and always brought him along wherever he went. However, T hated Mariposa, and so worked with Pentangeli to leak important information to the Corleone family. So what Mariposa did next sealed his fate. After the foiled attacks on the Corleone family, Mariposa knew there had to be a traitor, and for some reason had a feeling it was him. He was right, but Barzini did not know this, and so ignoring Barzini's pleas, he took him out right in front of him. And so, after the whole parade fiasco, and now his close friend, this was the last straw for Barzini. Mariposa had to go by any means necessary. Now with all that in mind, Barzini came to Don Vito to make a deal to end this once and for all. He began giving condolences and then started explaining his discontent content for what has transpired. This parade attack caused everyone to lose a lot of money. The cops were coming in with full force. No one was untouchable. He was nervous, surrounded by all of Vito's men, and after much back and forth, Barzini finally said it. Don Corleone, we believe you should be our leader. All of Mariposa's capos were also in agreement. The price? A fair division of Giuseppe's businesses. In the end, Vito agreed and told Barzini that Genko would be in touch to make the arrangements. Given the intel he was receiving, the fact Mariposa's men were standing to see their boss go insane. He knew they were too intelligent to stick around. The possibility they could switch sides was not too far-fetched, but this was only part of the truth. Vito needed to find out the real reason behind Barzini's betrayal, and then it all made sense. Once again, it was Barzini all along. Let me explain. You see, Vito realized that Barzini was the one who had organized the hit, once again hiring outsiders so they could blame it on that crazy Irish gang. But he didn't expect it to go so badly. Therefore, he was now scared of the other families turning against them. Barzini wanted to jump ship before it was too late. Given all the humiliation Mariposa and his organization suffered because of his various failures at taking out Vito, in addition to needing outside help from Capone, embarrassing him as well. And the simple fact is that he exposed himself quite clearly as a man 
whose word means nothing to him. A reckless man who can't be trusted. But now the question was, should Vito take out Barzini or trust him and his intentions? Here's how Vito thought about it. If he takes out Barzini, he would then need to fight Carmine Barzini, his brother, and the Rosado brothers, as well as Mariposa at the same time, stretching out this destructive war. But with Emilio alive and Mariposa dead, there will be five families, and the Corleones would be undoubtedly the strongest of the five. Vito's life goal was to build wealth for his family. He wanted his sons to enter the legitimate world and not suffer as he suffered, establishing the Corleone name across the country. With all this in mind, and given he was a student and by now a master of the game of power, he understood that there was no instance of a nation benefiting from a prolonged war. Quickness is the essence of war. Therefore, he knew he could rely on Barzini's genuine fear of all the families turning against him and Mariposa to keep his word, at least for the foreseen future. The final move. In the back room of a high-class restaurant filled with diners and celebrities sat Salvatore Tessio, who was to meet with Don Mariposa alongside Philip Tattaglia, Emilio Barzini, and Tomasino Cinquamani, one of Mariposa's most capable enforcers. You might be quite surprised why Mariposa was meeting with Tessio. Well, he simply didn't know that Tessio was actually a capo in the Corleone family. He was fairly distant, so everyone just assumed he worked for himself without taking sides, but he was in fact Vito's secret weapon. Mariposa was looking to make a deal with Tessio to do him a favor. They chatted for a while, making jokes and catching up. Tessio expressed his admiration and so on, and giving Mariposa the terms he wanted. And soon, they had agreed on a deal. Barzini and Tatalia excused themselves to quickly take care of some business. Tessio, Mariposa, and Cinquamani were now the only ones in the room. And then, it happened. <laughs> Tessio was the one who finished the job. Vito was now the one who held all the strings. The beginning of a new era, the era of the Corleone dynasty. The Aftermath after this victory, Vito held the very first official commission meeting, where he abolished the title of Boss of Bosses. However, the other Dons swore their loyalty and commitment for peace. They were now going to enter a new prosperous era, with Vito in the forefront. To make this video, we needed to do a lot of research. We analyzed the original novel by Mario Puzo, the film scripts, and really every other reliable source. But one of the main sources we looked at was the brilliant novel The Family Corleone by Ed Falco. It's a novel based on an unproduced screenplay by Mario Puzo, who had passed away in 1999. It was meant as the prequel to Puzo's The Godfather film. If you're a Godfather fan, this novel is a must-read. It's got a lot of depth, and Falco does a great job to capture the essence of the original novel's characters, but also adding new characters and events. We only scratched the surface in this video, so I highly recommend that you check it out. Thank you for watching, and now, if you've enjoyed this video, wait till you see how this one ends.